This is episode 477 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined this week by Hal Stratton. Uh, Hal is many things, and we're going to talk about a lot of them, but among those things, he is a co-founder of the Rio Grande Foundation and he was the chair of the Consumer Product Safety Administration up in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Tipping Point, New Mexico. Thank you, Paul. Take two. So, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we had some obstacles, let's just say this. We'll leave that for the uh, uh, for your imagination as we uh, arrive to this uh, particular episode. But I really appreciate you coming on, Hal, and uh, you know, not just taking a trip down memory lane. Now we're going to do that, but uh, also... Looking at uh, the way the Consumer Product Safety Administration kind of burst into Americans' minds o- over this uh, gas stove issue. But before we get into all of this, uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, personal history in New Mexico and New Mexico politics. Uh, how'd you get involved in New Mexico politics and share a little bit of that history? Well, I moved to New Mexico in in like the mid-70s and started working for a small law firm. And I was always interested in uh, philosophy and uh, not really politics, but, you know, the philosophical aspects of government. And so I got in, roped somehow into running for uh, the legislature. And I was living out where you live now on the west side. That was my district in those days. And I won. And nobody really expected that to happen. And I guess that happens a lot of times. And so that got me involved. And then after being in the legislature for a while, um, I decided I wasn't cut out for the legislature. And what, what era are we talking about where you were in the, in the roundhouse? Right. 1978 is when I was elected. So 79 through 86 would have been when I was there. Okay. And we had this conservative coalition back in those days that you've probably heard about where we had some... Democrats in southeastern New Mexico who threw in with the Republicans to form a coalition to, uh, you know, try to dial back some of the liberal direction of the state during those times. You you were in the House? In the House. That's okay. right. Yeah. And, and I was lucky enough at the end of that time, I was the last re- lawyer in the Republican side and in the coalition side. So the they, I was the last guy to be a lawyer, and so they had to make me chairman of Judiciary Committee wow. my last two My years. how times have changed, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't think you could go up to the roundhouse and uh, throw a rock and not hit uh, multiple attorneys up there uh, who were members of the of the legislature. That's, that's a big shift. Yeah, in New Mexico, it's um, more difficult for attorneys to serve because they're unpaid. And I thought, when I was young, I thought I would go up there and you know, spend the weekends or Friday through Sunday doing the work back in the office. But I didn't spend a minute doing the work back in the office. It was a full-time job right, right through the weekends, 24-7, just like it is now. And so you really got to be dedicated to it. And that puts a real cramp into uh, – they used to have a story about uh, how Turner Branch used to be in the legislature up there, a very famous New Mexico Albuquerque attorney. And I guess he used to have a telephone on his desk. He would have a telephone installed, no cell phones in those days. Yeah, yeah. And he would do his work from his desk there on, oh boy. on the floor of the house. So, um, so yeah, it, they, we didn't have any lawyers in, but that gave me a good platform to, I think everybody considered me to be a young, uh, know nothing, you know, conservative legislator. And then I got a chance to, you know, kind of show my chops running the Judiciary Committee for two years. And that helped me then, uh, you know, have enough credibility to run for attorney general in 1986. And that was more than anything else, a way to get out of the house because I was so tired of it that I, and I didn't feel like I could quit. I was too young. So I ran for that. And, and um, of course, no Republicans won that for a very long time. So there wasn't any reason to believe I was going to win. But the planets really aligned. And we had an unpopular Democrat governor. I was running against one of his cabinet secretaries. Um, I had higher than regular name ID um, because of the size of my district. Went, you know, I was living out where you live on the west side of Albuquerque, but it went all the way to Louisiana. Right. So it was a huge district. So, and I, I knocked doors in my district every time I ran. And so everybody, I, I had 
no legislator has real good name ID, but I, I had probably a little bit better name ID than the average legislator. Yeah, the West Side wasn't nearly as developed back in those <laughs> days, that's for sure. I mean, even since I've moved there uh, over the last now nearly 17 years, it's uh, it's grown tremendously, and uh, it seems like it's the uh, the growth hub of uh, Albuquerque. But uh, I, just real quick, uh, since it's a current issue, uh, and uh, Rio Grande Foundation, we have some thoughts about paid legislature, uh, more professionalized legislature, but we're not, th- this isn't our, our top issue up there right. this session. Right. What, what do you think about that concept as a former legislator? Well, while I was there, I was against it. And my friends around the country, because you become friends with other people in other states' legislatures who had those paid legislature said, whatever you do, don't do this, because it very much expands the work that the legislature does. Right. And if they get paid, they'll start thinking they really have to get things done, and it'll, they'll start doing things maybe they shouldn't be involved in. Um, at this point, um, I don't know how we avoid it, really. I think we're the last unpaid legislature in the country. And, of course, we're not 100% unpaid because we get federal per diem an equivalent of federal per diem for Santa Fe, right? Which right. is, I don't know what it is now, 150, 160, 170 a day. Um, that's tax free. And I can just remember when it was $40 a day. And when it went to 75, it was a huge deal because that's when I quit losing money being <laughs> in the legislature as a, as a young lawyer because that was a huge deal is having 75 instead of 40. So I don't know. I don't. You know, luckily I don't have to take a position on those things right now, but I have to say that it, um, you know, things move in that direction. And when you're the last outlier on that, it's probably going to be difficult to maintain that status, I would think. And uh, you were born and raised in Oklahoma, and you're a registered uh, member of the Cherokee Correct. Uh, Nation. Was was that, uh, you know, I, I, Cherokee have a, you know, kind of a higher profile, I guess, than a lot of native tribes uh, you know did that impact your politics or your work in any way or was it just kind of part of who you were and you moved on the latter yeah the latter i i don't think during my legislative years that really came up much um didn't come up much during the ag years either so um so i really have not used that as a for that purpose in, in other words i mean i use it more so now than i did then because the firm I'm with, we rep- we do a lot of Indian law, and I've become more interested in that than I used to be. And I'm certainly much more sympathetic, as I've learned over the years, about the tribes here in the West. The Cherokee tribes and the Oklahoma tribes are very different because they don't have reservations. Um, obviously, I don't look like an Indian. I mean, it's uh, like, you know, most folks do on out here in the West. And so it's a totally different ball game back there. Um but uh, that's a long answer to your question. No, I it's ne- never really came up uh, during the legislative days that I can remember. I mean, I I think maybe some maybe the legisl- some of the legislators maybe knew it, but yeah. we didn't talk about it much. Uh, being that the Cherokee aren't a presence here in New Mexico, probably made a made a big difference because you have various you know folks representing tribal areas that are kind of actively involved in trying to advance whatever interests they are they are looking at right. in that scope. But uh, just thought I'd ask that question. Uh, so you ran for attorney general and you are, uh, you know, in, in a way uh, we're, we're sitting here with royalty. You're the only <laughs> Republican attorney general in not just my lifetime, but our producer's lifetime and, you know, probably <laughs> the oldest person alive's lifetime because it's been a very, very, very long time since uh, there was a Republican attorney general in the state of New Mexico. Uh, so you mentioned some of the unique aspects of that race, but crime is obviously an issue that continues to be there today. Uh, it In the last election, the Republicans didn't seem to get as much traction on it. What did you do to highlight crime, which, you know, just off the hand, offhand, would you say it was worse than today, similar to today? How did that issue 
deviate from wh- what it's like today? And how did you turn that into a winning issue in a political campaign? I, I don't know if it was worse than it is today, but it, um, it was a bigger issue. It was just as big an issue in those days as it is now. Okay. I don't know. I don't know that that meant the crime rate was as high then. Sure. Well, what, 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 what kind of specific like? What were, what were the issues then? Well, the, uh, the the issues that I entered into when I went into the legislature was that we had a we had trouble with the judges putting people in jail after they committed crimes, and because of that, we passed this determinate sentencing law that's that set the exact numbers and made it a mandatory. In the legislature. In the legislature. This was before I went to the AG. Right. But I'd done all that stuff, and we we did firearm enhancements. We did um, recidivist uh, enhancements when it came to um, crime, and that all happened kind of right after I got in. In 1979, in the next couple, three years, we put all that together because we had this coalition that we could get things passed, and um, Bruce King was a governor at that time, and uh, something he felt like he needed to approve, I guess. And so that carried, you know, that didn't stop crime. Uh, so it's difficult to stop all crime, obviously. And so there's still plenty of it. Did it make a dent? Um, I don't know. Okay. That's I don't fair. know. I mean, you'd, we'd have to look at other folks's, uh, you know, it all depends on what happens out in the field, right? Right. Because even though you have determined sentencing, judges still have the ability to suspend sentences and to um, defer sentences and to do all those kind of things. Um, but, um, you know, one of the other things that happened in 1980, we had that horrible prison riot up in Santa Fe. And as a young, uh, immature legislator, I was actually out there at the prison during the riot watching the whole thing. And they allowed us, a couple, three of us legislators, I remember the lieutenant governor was out there too, taking pictures. Roberto Mondragon was the attorney general at that okay. time. And he was taking pictures with his instant camera, but we were out there and watched the whole thing. And, that traumatized everybody. I sure. mean, we went back to the legislature after that. 33 inmates killed. 11 guards were taken prisoner, many of whom were injured. And we were just all in shock. And so we ended up passing some bad legislation after that. But that's behind us now. Uh, <laughs> and that happens when you have those traumatic events. But so you think that was an issue in the, uh, in the AG race? It was. Okay. It was an issue. And the prisons were an issue because we had a consent decree that had been entered into by a previous attorney general that a lot of us thought was ill-advised. And it gave prisoners uh, here in New Mexico a lot more rights in the prison than they would have under normal common law. Uh, Individual rooms, they each had to have their individual cell, (laughs) which, I mean, you can look at that one of two ways. I mean, is that solitary confinement or do you have your own private room and in those days, it was looked at as having your own private room. And, and so we, we fought that. Um, in fact, we went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, we filed a petition to get that overturned. And the court, by one vote, uh, declined to hear it. So that was a very big issue at the time. And so crime was just, you know, it's ubiquitous, it seems like. And unfortunately, here in New Mexico... Um, Although there are other places that have just as much crime as we have. I mean, Chicago and, uh, you know, New York, any any of the big cities, right? I mean, you're going to have a lot of crime. Um, But um, with our size of our city here, we just feel like we have too much of it for who we are and what the size is. And that was the case in those days. Right. And so I decided to run against crime. And uh, the Rick Johnson Agency, which was the leading ad agency here in New Mexico, uh, signed on to help me out. And they put together uh, this ad campaign of Stratton versus crime. So I was running against crime and not really my opponent. In fact, sure. I seldom mentioned my opponent during the whole thing. No, no negative no negative ads in those days. I put the kibosh on that. I didn't want to go, go through negatively because if you do that and you lose, then it seems like you maybe you live with it a little bit more than if you'd actually won the race. So I didn't believe in it anyway. So... Um, we had big billboards down at I-25 and I-40, um, which Rick and his company were able to tie up for me. I would have never gotten those without him. Oh. And we had big billboards there, and they were ta- they were the talk of the town through the campaign and the newspapers, and everybody thought they were notorious and they were famous. I mean, they were both ways. If you didn't like the way they looked and you, you thought I was being, you know, um, too 
uh, emphasizing crime too much. And if you liked it, then you thought these are great. But they worked. Yeah. And, uh, and when you put all of those things together, and every single thing had to happen right, because I only won by 690 votes statewide, which is not very many. But just to get to that level, everything had to go exactly right for a Republican to win. So, so it's 80% maybe not your, you know, you're not in control of it. You gotta, there's got to be a wave, and then you have to do the right things to catch that wave. And most of the time, unfortunately, we Republicans here in New Mexico haven't caught it. And... Um, because we haven't necessarily had the tools to do it, but that's that's how it happened. Well, uh, nobody wants to replicate the prison riots, and I, I'm not saying that that was key to your victory or success, but that's a uh, uh, that's a a big uh, seminal event in New Mexico history, and hopefully we uh, never have to go back there. And that doesn't mean that uh, you know some future Republicans shouldn't win Attorney General. It just means that uh, <laughs> hopefully they don't have to go that particular that particular direction we had a great candidate this last year yeah um, and he had um he i believe he's every bit as qualified as i was when i ran and it's just you know the votes aren't there right and so it makes it very difficult when when you don't have you any race you run you've got to identify enough swing votes historically to win the race seldom does anybody come in with a personality and the tools to win a race where there, where you haven't identified a certain number of swing voters in the past, and I guess that happens. I can't come up with one right now, but um, that's now we don't seem to have those. Right. Uh, so uh, you're you got reelected as attorney general? And, no. No. Oh, okay. In those days. Oh, that was a one term deal. We were one term, uh, limited by the constitution to one term, and at the end of that term. You couldn't run for another state office either. Oh, goodness. So it was, uh, it put you back out on the street, basically. And I was really pleased because a congressional seat came open um, right in the middle of my attorney general uh, term that Steve Schiff ran for and won. And I was thrilled that that happened because I did not want to run for Congress. And if when I left, if there was a congressional seat open, I probably would have been compelled to it, uh, compelled to do that. But I never pictured myself as being in the Congress. And I was glad that Steve Schiff won that and served a very distinguished career there in the House afterwards. Now, uh, then you, so what year were you done at the Attorney General's office? The last day of 1990. So okay. 1991, I was back out on the streets, so to speak. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you, uh, over the next decade, uh, worked to co-found the Rio Grande Foundation because we came around in the year 2000. Uh, I wasn't involved in the initial startup phase, but uh, talk about you know, your interest in the Rio Grande Foundation and what kind of reasoning you had and how that all got going. Well, when I got out of government in 1991, um, some of us decided we didn't have a free market think tank in New Mexico, but we needed one because the legislators didn't really have that resource. And so we formed the New Mexico Economic Research Foundation, and we thought we were going to get some help from one of the U.S. senators, and that didn't turn out, and it just kind of languished. And so we didn't do anything with it. And then in the late 90s, um, a guy by the name of Harry Messenheimer called me out of the blue and asked if I was the head of the New Mexico Economic Research Foundation. <laughs> and I said, well, I confess, I, maybe I am, but there's no such thing. And he said, well, why not? He said, why aren't we doing this? We need to do this, and um, this is something that we ought to put our heads together and do it. Harry was a uh, Ph.D. economist from George Mason University back in Virginia. So he was, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was the, the brains of the organization, basically. And then I came in, I formed it, did the executive director's job and raised the money. We put together a big tax study um, at that time, talking about how New Mexico was overtaxed, and that's how we got the, got things going. So you got to give Harry some credit there because he's the one he's the one that called me up and said, well, you should be doing this. Why aren't you doing it? <laughs> well, Harry was, uh, was the person who I was uh, you know, kind of dealing with when I took over the foundation and March of 2006, which uh, 
that means that we're close to 17 years since I took uh, the foundation's reins over. But uh, let's dig into that a little more because uh, so in ERF, interesting, uh, as a kid playing with Nerf footballs and whatnot, uh, New Mexico, I guess you could do the new Murf, uh, What? But did that transition directly into Rio Grande Foundation or uh, because the foundation's bylaws and whatnot get started at, at 2000 right so was no. that, that was a totally different organization yeah we started all over because okay. those were what seven eight nine ten years old no, nothing had happened got it and we c- tried to come up with the right name for the for the group i i wanted rio grande institute and and that was it, nobody was using it but it was taken at the secretary of state and they wouldn't give it to me because they wanted to shake the people that had it down for taxes uh. Yeah. And so we had to go Rio Grande Foundation, which, you know, that's that's worked out pretty well. Pretty uh, apropos name, I think, here in New Mexico and in Albuquerque. Sure. Now, uh, you know, with the foundation, did you have a specific suite of policy issues that you felt needed to be addressed? Or was it just broadly New Mexico wasn't uh, very free market? I mean, we're talking about, so the year 2000, uh, was that, that was... During the Johnson administration, as I, you know, he was governor from like the 94 to 2002, as I recall. So uh, in some ways, those were pretty good yeah. times for New Mexico uh, growing and uh, a free market guy at the head, the legislature, not so much. Right. And, um, and I mean, look, during my whole term in government, and this goes for all government, really, um, there are. I think we're overtaxed. I think we pay too much in taxes, and I think it's better to leave money in people's hands. The government doesn't spend it too wisely. Take it from me. I've been there at the state and federal level, and they're not the most efficient users of our of our money. And then you just look at New Mexico being 50th in everything. Even when Gary Johnson was governor, I mean, he could only do so much. He did not have the legislature. Those guys are the guys that pass the laws, and, yeah, he can sign them or— whatnot but and he wasn't into signing executive orders and doing you know ultra virus things that he shouldn't be doing he was pretty strict about that um but my view was we needed a free market voice in new mexico because we didn't have that and uh the, the taxes were first and we commissioned a tax study i remember it cost us twenty five thousand dollars to have some institute i'm sorry i can't remember where it was maybe new hampshire um, take their model and do our tax structure and compare it to what it really ought to be. And so that was our first big project. So you'd have to say taxes was our was our first big issue. Um, I also, back in the day, we haven't talked about this, but back in my legislative days, I formed New Mexicans for Tax Limitation after the National Tax Limitation Committee. And, and we supported lower taxes, but also a spending limit amendment for the government which Milton Friedman had drafted, and we took Milton Friedman's amendment, tailored it to the state level, and tried to get that passed. And I came within, I died on a tie vote my last year as um, in the Senate, my last year as a legislator. I had that introduced, and what that would have done is limit the growth of state government to the growth of the private sector, generally. And you can't be too rigid about that. There has to be you know, escape hatches and things like that in it. But it was a general philosophy that we wanted to say, you know, our government's big enough, let's limit it to the, and let's prioritize what we do in government. And if we do that, then we're well, going to have enough money for what we need to do. Come on, Hal, that's that's crazy talk. What are you talking about there? <laughs> that, uh, all I can say is that New Mexico would be a very different state if we had any uh, reasonable limitation on spending and you know you can look at Colorado as just the the one example and uh, you know Colorado first and foremost folks they did it through a constitutional amendment they have the initiative and referendum process for better or for worse the voters can pass things directly they amended their constitution in the early 90s to limit spending growth to inflation and population growth it's called the taxpayers bill of rights and while Colorado in many ways has gone off the progressive uh, deep end, uh, that taxpayer's bill of rights has restrained Colorado government in ways that are foreign concepts to us here in New Mexico. And we don't have the initiative and referendum pro- process 
again, for better or for worse, uh, we just don't have that ability to make direct laws uh, through the through the state process. Like well, that. And here's another important provision. Since we're talking about the Constitution, which is one of my favorite subjects, back th throughout history, New Mexico's had what we has been termed the anti-donation clause, and what that in the Constitution, and what that means is you can't take government money and just give it to a private entity. And um, that has saved us a lot of money over the years. And when I was attorney general, I enforced that, took a lot of grief from it, not from liberals, but from business people who want the state's money. And it, it uh, they tried to amend it four or five times up through the, my term as attorney general by putting it on the ballot and having the constitution amended. People turned it down. And then finally in 1994, they got a provision passed that has pretty much um, gutted the anti-donation clause. But so now in New Mexico, we, we have a situation, the federal government can do this. You take your money, Paul Guessing's money, by taxes, and then you give it to whoever for nothing, without any return, without any quid pro quo or any consideration. And so we've been going the other direction than the way you've described Colorado when it comes to how we protect our government resources. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we have a lawsuit that we've recently filed against the city of Albuquerque for donating $250,000 to Planned Parenthood. Now, uh, I would uh, file a lawsuit against them donating our tax dollars to anybody, but uh, th this is uh, really... Uh, I think one of the critical things to defend in terms of New Mexico's good public policies that we do have on the books, and that is the anti-donation clause, which, as you said, has been weakened significantly over the uh, over the decades. But uh, okay, so when I took over the Rio Grande Foundation in '06, you were out of state. You were in Washington D.C. because when George W. Bush took over as uh, you know, got elected president in 2000 and was uh, you know, inaugurated in 2001. You were uh, plucked out of New Mexico by the, the W. Bush administration to run the Consumer Product Safety Commission, right? Correct. Commission, not administration. It's I, commission. Sometimes I, you know, <laughs> it, it's Washington. They've got so many acronyms. But uh, talk about why that happened and a little bit about your time with that particular commission, and then we can talk about some more current events uh, that's uh, relating to gas stoves in particular. Right. Well, quickly, uh, my friends in D.C. who were in the Reagan administration called up and said, you got to come do something in at the federal level. And I felt like I needed to, to do some type of federal public service. And so sorted through a bunch of jobs back there, and this one came up, the chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and, and that's the one that, frankly, I decided on. Uh, doing. And um, uh, in my defense, I just have to say, when we started the Rio Grande Foundation, I always said, I'm the right guy to start this and get it going. I'm not the right guy to run it. And that's why when you came on in 2006, you really put it on the map because you are the right guy to run it and have been. So, um, but I don't think, I mean, Harry obviously was um, uh, peeved at me for running off to Washington, D.C. after doing this, and I get that. But it's something I felt like I had to do. And well, when the president calls you, or, or whoever called on behalf of the president, right. you kind of, it, it's something you, you want to serve your country. So uh, We can spend two, uh, two of your uh, Tipping Point podcasts on the confirmation process and the selection process someday if you want to, because it was a torturous route getting to that point, and they even had another. They they also had asked me to be uh, uh, the uh, admin, uh, the assistant administrator for enforcement at the EPA, Ooh. and I couldn't figure out which one to do. And I asked them, and they didn't know. They just said because they have different silos in the White House, they don't care that you've already committed to do this job. They want they've got a this other silo has a position they have to fill, so they're happy to steal you from the other silo. And so I was never been through the process, was confused, but I finally landed on the. Consumer Product Safety Commission, because it is an independent commission, assuming you believe in that, <laughs> assuming you believe in the, you know, when you look at the unitary executive, if you think there can be one, it is one. So I didn't report to anybody, and that was a good thing, and didn't really have a schedule, didn't have to do a 
punch a time clock or anything like that. And I ran the agency. That was maybe the most important thing is it's not just being chairman of the commission, but you actually run the agency that's doing all the work as an executive officer. And so that was important to me too. Were there any uh, particularly uh, interesting or controversial issues that came up when you were uh, at the Consumer Product Safety Commission? Something that specifically remembers that defined your time there? Well, <laughs> when you said define my time, I have a two-hour PowerPoint on bizarre things that came up. I hope I don't know if any one of them defined my time, but one of my favorite ones was um, there was a product called the Rod, and the it rod. was the Rod, and okay. it, it was put online, uh, being sold online um, to uh, use to chasten your children. And get wow. them and get them uh, to do the right thing uh, according to biblical passages. Okay. And much, Spare the rod, spoil the child. I believe they they marketed that one before. That's right. And um, much to my chagrin, that was being uh, sold out of Ufala, Oklahoma. Oh. Which is the home of the Selman brothers and also uh, former Congressman J. C. Watt. So I was a little embarrassed by that, and and uh, I talked to the folks in the agency, and I said, so what about this? I think you know this is a little. Doesn't look too good. And they said, yeah, but, you know, we're, we're not sure it violates the Consumer Product Safety Act because you use it for a particular purpose and it serves that purpose. And other than that purpose, it's not really unreasonably dangerous. So, And so I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to deal with this, with this problem? Because I'm not the type that likes to enforce laws that don't exist. And so the way that ended, and I used this, I started a law school class at George Mason University on attorneys general. And I... I use this as an example for the students to try to solve, should this product be outlawed or should it not under the Consumer Product Safety Act? And we don't have enough time to go into the details. But finally, the people from Ufala called us and begged us to outlaw it and to publicize that we're outlawing it because they were getting so many death threat calls over this product that it almost ruined their life. And so they took it off the market. It ended up not having to be recalled. But anyway, you ask about one that's memorable. There's a, there's, that's, that's there's memorable. a memorable one right there. And, um, you know, there's plenty of others. The CPSC did some studies. There was a famous one about uh, the five-gallon buckets that they designed that, uh, to make them safer. They put a hole in them. And uh, we always wondered, well, how does a bucket with a hole serve the purpose? And I guess they had some kind of rigmarole never you don't find them now because it didn't work and so um there's a lot of different examples of lawn lawn darts were a big issue they were outlawed back in the six in the 70s and i would i've done radio shows where people call me up and chewed me out for um outlawing lawn darts when wow. it was done you know 20 years before i was there so there's just all kinds of different gasoline cans was a big issue if you have bought a gasoline can lately from walmart or wherever you buy your the hardware store you'll know that the spouts on them are impossible to use. And right. um, that's a CPSC and now federal legislative fix. So, um, and, you know, the list goes on. It's all consumer products, pretty much. So any consumer product is regulated there by the CPSC. And, uh, of course, uh, most recently, uh, one of the commissioners, now, again, you, you did a good job explaining that you were the chair, not just a commissioner, but uh, a commissioner recently under Biden, uh, Richard Trumka Jr., who that's an, in itself a potential story because his dad was, of course, the head of the ACL, ACLU, AFL-CIO for decades. Uh, but Trumka Jr. Uh, was out. He's the one that kind of started this firestorm about gas stoves. Now, uh, there is no doubt that uh, folks on the left side of the political spectrum do want to ban gas appliances, starting with our own U.S. Senator Martin Heinrich. But uh, when we talked about this, the it, it's, you're a little skeptical as to whether the Consumer Product Safety Commission would be the uh, correct avenue for this. And just talk about how that whole process <clears throat> got started and why... Uh, why gas stoves really probably aren't the purview of the CPSC. Right. Well, it's all the agenda of the um, climate change movement is what it is. And the CPSC really doesn't deal with that. The CPSC deals with safety. So when you look at a gas stove or you look at any other product, the CPSC is supposed to be determining whether that is a safe 
an unreasonably dangerous product for the market. And if it's unreasonably dangerous, and it's a little bit more complicated definition than that, then they do have the authority to go in and, and do recalls, and they can ban products. And a stove is within the jurisdiction of the U.S. Consumer Product or the U.S. Uh, consumer, U, U, consumer Product Safety Commission. You got me going toward <laughs> administration here. But only in the safety aspects. It doesn't regulate quality. It doesn't regulate the climate. And so what this was is a new commissioner trying to get some publicity, get out ahead of the agency, going off the reservation, going off like that. I know the other folks at the CPSC are, are not on board with this, so... That's why I think it won't happen there. And uh, the the CPSC, you have the staffer, the the person who is you, uh, although the new you, of course, Biden's uh, chair. They were not the ones pushing this, uh, but the commissioners. Uh, it's fairly typical in Washington for these bodies to be made of some quasi bipartisan group where the administration in power gets one more vote, which yeah. generally is enough to get their policies passed. But what is it? Five commissioners and one right. chair? Five or, commissioners with a chair. And and the, the party in power usually has the majority of the commissioners, but only by one. You can't have a bigger, you can't have a super majority. You can all, it's got to be three to two. Now it was, it was two to one when I was there. We only had three commissioners when I was there, but typically the commissioners, it, the CPSC is so chairman-centric that if the commissioners start getting off the reservation, they may lose some other access that they have there that the commission, that the chairman is sharing with them. So it's very rare for them to get off the reservation this far. This never happened when I was there. Because um, uh, you kept those guys in line. Well, <laughs> we, we ran a tight ship, let me put it that way. And maybe we ran it too tight. But we just felt like that it was right to have one. You know, I've, we've always thought maybe we need a commissioner or maybe we need an administrator instead of a uh, commission or a committee to run things. Um, we thought it would be much more, much, it, it would reflect the administration more. It would be easier. You could get something done. You, the, they're, they're so bureaucratic at the CPSC, and not just because of the people there, but because of their legislation that forms them and controls them. You literally can't get anything done. I yeah. mean, I didn't, I didn't get any regulations passed in four years while I was there. So you, it's almost impossible to get a regulation passed. Most of the regulations at the CPSC are mandated through legislation by Congress. So, um, but anyway, that's... So Congress tells them that they want to regulate, I don't know, the rod. Gasoline cans. Gasoline cans. Yeah. And the CPSC salutes and says, okay, and do does the CPSC then engage with a scientific process and come up with the regulation, or does Congress just kind of cram down everything? Lately, it's been the latter. Okay. Lately, Congress has... What they have said is, go adopt this voluntary standard that's been developed by UL or ASTM or CSA or one of the standard development organizations. Um, but they could do it the way you suggested, too. It should be with scientific. I mean, it should all be scientific, right? I mean, we shouldn't be banning products from consumers in the U.S. unless there's a very good reason to do it, because they should have the right to choose what they want and... Um, not have some government agency tell them um, that they can't have a rod or they can't have a gasoline can that actually works. Or they, you know, the, you pick whichever one you think has been outlawed. We had we had water yo-yo balls. Uh, if you remember what those were, it was a, they were a big round squishy ball uh -huh. on a tether. And the kids used to use them and, you know, they're, they're a lot of fun. My daughters had them. And, um, but kids would get the, get the tether wrapped around their neck and moms would freak out. Well, they banned them in Canada. They banned them in the EU. They banned them in Japan. I think Australia. And we didn't ban them. And the reason we didn't ban them is because our scientific compliance staff went down and did five hours of work trying to hurt themselves with one and they couldn't do it. And so they came back to me and they said, Mr. Chairman, we have spent five hours and we do not think this is unreasonably dangerous. I'm sorry, we don't have the evidence for you to ban this product in the U.S. 
well, you didn't even know about the product, right? No. Nope. And you don't know about any deaths on the product, and you don't know about any serious injuries on the product, yet all these other countries were able to ban them because of politics, not because of science. And luckily, we used the science and didn't ban them. And so that's just an example of how we tried to work differently than other jurisdictions. Well, I really appreciate your time and uh, the breadth of your knowledge and information about the history of the Rio Grande Foundation, CPSC, and New Mexico politics. So uh, definitely a fascinating conversation and uh, something uh, I, I really enjoyed catching up with you, Hal. So thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube and Rumble channels. Subscribe to the show at Apple Stitcher or have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.